Hi everyone, my name is Anne Felden. I am a postdoc in the Applied Numerical Algorithm Group here at the lab. And uh, I'm working with Don Martin on a subglacial hydrology model that has adaptive mesh refinement features. So let's start with the context of this study. I guess the big picture is sea level change, as we can see here on this little plot. Uh, we see that the sea level rise has increased pretty much linearly over the past three decades at a rate of 3.3 millimeter per year. And what the colored plots show on this graph here is that the uh, global mean sea level change are mainly driven by three processes, two of them being relatively important. Ice melt being the most important one, it's shown here in green and it accounts for more than half of the sea level rise. Um, and we think that this uh, sea level rise trend is actually going to worsen over the next decades and centuries. But I guess the main takeaway here is that melting of the cryosphere was the largest contributor to sea level rise during the past few decades and is still expected to be in the decades and centuries to come. But, so let's take a minute and talk about the cryosphere for those of you that are not familiar with uh, what that is. Uh, the cryosphere is basically everything that's you know frozen on this earth. So it can be ice caps, snow, glaciers, permafrost, um, icebergs, um, but mainly ice sheets. Ice sheets are actually uh, the biggest reservoir of the world's freshwater ice. They, they contain about 90% of it. Um, and where are they uh, located right now on this earth? There's one at the north pole and another one at the south pole, the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet. And the Greenland, the Greenland ice sheet is probably uh, the one that's gonna melt the fastest. But what's important here is that combined, the meltwater from both these ice sheets could raise sea levels by about 60 meters. And 60 meters is huge. Um, this, this is a major problem for coastal populations. San Francisco would be underwater. Um, yes, so this is a, a pretty dramatic uh, increase of, of, of sea levels. Okay, so we have uh, seen that um, we need to study the cryosphere because it is uh, lo losing its mass to the ocean. And we have seen that a big part of this cryosphere is actually composed of ice sheets. So we need to study ice sheet dynamics. And let's take a moment and look at this little video here on the right. What we see is an ice sheet progressing towards the ocean and progressively losing its mass to the ocean. So it's it's breaking into small pieces that are eventually floating away into the sea. Um, and this is called a calving event. And calving events are pretty dramatic. Uh, this is one of the of the ways that you know ice sheets are losing mass to the ocean. There are others, but this illustrates the issue, which is that ice sheets are actually coupled with their environment, strongly coupled with their environment. And we, when we are studying ice sheets, we cannot just study ice sheet. We need to take into account all the boundaries. And in particular, um, it has been shown that water lubrication at the base, so the amount of water contained within the ice sheet in the soil, is actually an important factor controlling ice sheet motion. And this is what we're going to talk about next. OK. So um, yes, let's look at an example uh, that should illustrate one way water lubrication is known to influence. Ooh, I don't know what happened here. Um, yes, okay. Let's so let's com consider a simple example that should illustrate one way that water lubrication um, impacts ice sheet motion. Observation suggests that there's a seasonal cycle that exists. So every year we see the effect of uh, basal uh, water on the ice sheet motion. And how uh, does that happen? Well, every summer, as the temperature is rising, surface of the ice sheet is melting. And the ice is eventually percolating through the ice sheet to reach the, to reach the base, where it forms a sheet between the ice sheet and the soil. And what this does is effectively rising the water pressure. And um, what um, happens is that the ice sheet is lifted and accelerating, um, accelerated. And um, this continues throughout the summer. And when su a sufficient amount of water has percolated and reached the base, the structure of the water at the base starts to change. Instead of being a sheet, it starts forming canals and channels. And that eff effectively lowers the water pressure and enables the ice sheet velocity to return to preseason values. And we actually see this 
happening every year. So we know that this happens. We know that this is an issue. And so that's why we know that we need to take, you know, basal um, water into account when we study ice sheets. Okay, so modeling basal water or, you know, subglacial drainage, which is the same thing, um, is a challenge. Why is it a challenge? Well, mainly for two reasons. One of them being that, you know, the variety of water structures found within an ice sheet can be very, very uh, different. We, we have so many different structures. Um, we have subglacial and englacial structures that we need to take into account. Uh, what do I call englacial and subglacial? Englacial are the uh, structures that are contained within the ice sheets and subglacial are the structures that are at the base of the ice sheet. Uh, and as we can see on this little image here, we have, you know, lakes, cavities, fractures, um, channels, moulins, which are channels that are vertical, and also different types of, of water, right? We have real water, but also water mixed with sediments, mixed with, you know, ice. Um, so all those different structures. And we need to know if we need to take all of those into account, or maybe we can take just um, you know, a subgroup of them into account or group them depending on their characteristics. So those are all questions that we need to, uh, things that we need to worry about when we want to study ice sheets. And then another problem stems from the fact that we are interested in extremely localized regions uh, within something very big, you know, like as we can see on this bottom right hand side figure here, uh, which depicts the Antarctica, we see that Antarctica is basically a 5,000 kilometer per 5,000 kilometer block of ice. And um, yes, it's losing its mass to the ocean, but it's losing its mass in very localized area. And so when we want to study, you know, um, um, when we want to study um, um, ice sheets and subglacial hydrology, we need to worry about very localized areas typically of the order of, you know, a thousand kilometer to maybe 10 kilometers. And so we have a discrepancy here of length scales that is significant and um, that can cause problems. So the idea is to use a model that can first reconcile the different subglacial structures in order to make sure that we can take all of them into account in one way or the other, and then build a, an adaptive mesh refinement subglacial hydrology model, which is gonna enable us to deal with this discrepancies of length scales. Okay, so I'm gonna treat those two points uh, one after the other. So I'm gonna start with using a model that can reconcile the different subglacial structures. So first of all, we need to look at what are the ingredients of a subglacial hydrology model. So usually we start with an equation for mass conservation. Then we have a relation between the water flux and the hydraulic head. And the hydraulic head is actually our main variable. This is a variable that we're gonna be interested with because this is gonna be the one that's gonna help us couple this subglacial hydrology model with an ice sheet model eventually. Uh, and then we need to take balance equations into account for the different drainage spaces. And there we can go into a lot of details or not, depending on, on you know, what we want to study. Um, as I show here on this little image, we have a variety of, you know, water structures as I talked about a little bit earlier. But what has been shown is that these structures can actually be categorized into two different groups. Uh, there's either efficient channelized structures or inefficient distributed structures. And um, you can either, you know, simulate even different elements within one category or just um, elements representing each category or just one category, you can go into as much details as you want here. But if you wanna take into account more than one element, then you need to find a way to couple the multiple system components. And um, th those are basically the ingredients of a subglacial hydrology model. So let's take a moment here and look at what those ingredients are in our specific model. Um, first of all, I should start by saying that we are focusing on a set of equations and a type of subglacial hydrology model that is very similar to one that is uh, already existing in the literature, uh, Shakti, which I provide a link um, to here, and you can check it out if you're interested. Um, but so let's see those ingredients. First, there's an equation for mass conservation, we, we said. Um, this is pretty standard, right? I mean, we are solving for the subglacial water gap height. 
and it evolves according to a very classical equation. Um, what makes it change is the, the amount of melt rate at the base and also additional source terms. So those source terms could be, as we talked about earlier, just seasonal source terms. For example, water percolating through the ice during the summer. We could have this into the source terms, for example. Then there's a, a dependence a, a relation between the water flux and the hydraulic head. Um, and what's interesting in this model is that, that, that we chose is that um, we can have both laminar and turbulent flow regimes. And that's not always the case. A lot of models assume either one or the other, but because we have this um, term that depends on the Reynolds number here, we can either have, we can have actually different types of flows, either laminar or turbulent. And um, this is an important piece of uh, the model. And then we have the last piece, which is, you know, the, the equations for each sub elements, each water structure you want to consider. And in our case, we're actually only considering one equation, but that one equation can both do cavity and channel like elements. And how do we manage this? We manage this by having two terms that control the opening. Opening is how, you know, the, the ice opens to form um, water structures, right? So how it melts and everything. So we have um, two different opening terms. One of them is opening by melt, and the other one is opening by sliding over the bed. Um, and um, yeah, the, the first one opening by melt is usually channel-like, and the second one opening by sliding is usually typically cavity-like. So we ha by having both in the same equation, we can actually have a model that, that can both produce um, uh, channel-like structures and cavity-like structures. And then we have a closure by creep, as is kind of um, usually uh, admitted in the literature. Okay, so the main thing to remember here is that with these, these, this set of equations, we can have a switch between channels and cavities that should be embedded in, in the equations. Okay, so let's stop for a minute and talk about AMR. Um, <clears throat> so when we perform numerical simulations, what we have is a computational domain that we discretize in order to compute whatever we're interested with. Um, and this is shown here in those images, a base discretization. The thing is that if we want to have, you know, sub kilometer, for example, resolution at some uh, regions of interest, if we use same discretization everywhere, we're going to have so many cells um, and so many things to compute that it's going to take forever. And we don't want that. So one way to deal with that is to have adaptive mesh refinement. And what this effectively does is use fine grids, uh, patches of fine grids on top of the base discretization only where, on, where we're interested in having some more details. So in this example here, for example, let's say we're interested in the ice divide, which is usually in the middle of the domain, the ice divide is usually where the ice is the thickest. You could have a sensor in your, um, in your code that detects where the ice is, is the, the, the thickest. So for example, the ice height, and then it will add refinement only on this region of interest. And we would have in the end, uh, a discretization that resembles the one that's shown here and highlighted. Okay, um, the ultimate goal with our subglacial hydrology model is eventually to couple it with a ice sheet model. And why not use the one that we develop at the lab, right? So bicycles. Uh, bicycles is based on the Chombo framework. Um, it, it is using a finite volume method. And basically, we just want to make sure that we use the same piece, um, the same pieces in, in, in our subglacial hydrology model so that eventually uh, it could be coupled to bicycles because subglacial hydrology in itself is fascinating, but um, it's the ice sheet that we want to uh, study and we want to have information about provided links. If you guys are interested, you can check that out. Okay, so let's take a moment and um, talk about the subglacial hydrology model in more details. Um, it is called SUMO. Uh, it is, as I said earlier, Chombo based. Uh, the equations are similar to that using Shakti, which is a model existing in the literature. And eventually we have a system that is composed of two equations, one for the gap height and another one for the hydraulic head. Those are the two, the two um, um, variables we're interested with and the hydraulic head being the most important one because this is what's going to be used eventually to provide boundary conditions to the ice sheet. Um, so the second equation here is a nonlinear problem that we solve right now by means of Picard iterations. I've provided here a little um, 
scheme, I mean, I've explained a little bit what our Picard iterations are doing. Um, it's pretty classical. Um, we have a tolerance of 10 to the minus seven. So whenever we, each time step, we do Picard iterations uh, until the difference between two subsequent iterates um, fall under that tolerance. Um, I've also like just put this little image here of a grid with you know circles and, and cross so that you can see that the main variables actually live at the cell center, but because we have gradients and fluxes, those live at the face. Um, if you guys are interested in knowing more about the algorithm, I will be happy to talk about this with you. Uh, but let's look into results now because equations are great, but uh, images and pictures are better. So this is a very first validating example. Again, it's taken from the Shakti paper because we are comparing ourselves to them because our equations are so similar. Um, uh, let's talk about the setup. So on the right hand side of the slide, this is just a, you know, one kilometer per one kilometer square. Um, if the bed is smooth and tilted, um, the ice on top of this um, square is uh, with a constant thickness of 500 meters. We have a periodicity in the y direction and then the um, moulin at the center of the domain that delivers the moulin. What is it? Is It's a source of water that delivers a constant source of water throughout the computation. So the water is effectively going <clears> to <throat> uh, flow from the right, I mean, from the center, I guess, to the left, where it reaches uh, Dirichlet uh, boundary conditions. And uh, yes, yeah, so this is basically what we simulate. This is one level of refinement so far, and we compare ourselves to Shakti. So sumo results, if you look now on the left-hand side of this figure, uh, the sumo results are on the right and the Shakti results are on the left. And um, we can only do qualitative comparisons at this point because we don't have the data, but we are pretty happy with what we see. We, we see a channel forming, the gap height, which is in the bottom of this figure, shows where the channel is forming and it is in our case, because we have regular mesh elements, it's just going to be a straight line. Whereas in Chakti, because they have this different unstructured elements, it can it, it forms something that's a little bit more corrugated. But overall, uh, we are pretty happy with the results, and this validates. This this serves as the first validation of our algorithm. So the second thing we did is this ex exact same problem, but adding. Um, additional meshes. Um, and so in this case, we have two levels of refinement. And uh, it's the same problem. We just wanted to ensure that, you know, the by providing a sensor, the algorithm could follow where um, it needed to add patches uh, of grid. So uh, the sensor we use in this case is based on the melt rate because where ice is going to melt, the channel is going to form, right? So that's what we did. And uh, yeah, we're pretty happy with what it's doing. It's doing something slightly bizarre here. It's not an exact a straight line. It's a sort of a broken line. And we're investigating why that is. We're not completely sure right now. Um, but overall, uh, if the point here was to show that the AMR piece of the algorithm was working, we're pretty happy with that. OK, so I will just conclude by um, stating a few um, things that we're currently working on. So yeah, as I said just before, we're fixing a couple of weird observations that we have right now. We also have one linked to the delta t, the time step. Um, Picard iterations are just not behaving exactly the way that we would expect. Um, I've also been trying to replace the Picard iterations with a multigrade full approximation scheme because even if Picard iterations uh, worked great, they're still not uh, extremely efficient. So we want to have something more efficient. And so that's what I've been doing for the past actually month and a half. It's almost ready. Uh, then I've also been working on and off in, on uh, enabling more complex bed topographies and ice geometries because the, the bed is not going to be smooth. The ice is not going to be constant slab of ice, it's going to have interesting features that we want to take into account that probably have a big impact. Um, and eventually, we want to perform convergence analysis for obvious reasons. 
Um, so yeah, that, that's it. I welcome questions, me and Dan, you can email us if you have any kind of input. Um, and thank you. <laughs> I'll see you later.